please welcome to the stage Miss Sheila Johnson. <laughs> How about that welcome from the Tampa Hello, Bay audience? Everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Well, we are so honored to have you in our presence today. We know it's been a very busy past few months for you launching your book, Walk Through Fire. Uh, so let's jump right into the questions uh, this afternoon. Why was now the right time for you to share your story? And after being silent for so long, how does it feel to finally have your story out in your own words? this has been a uh, journey for me it's been a therapeutic journey it's for years even since selling black entertainment television I have been suffering from depression and just trying to as my mother would say get your power back and it was a case where I helped build a company and I was totally erased out of this and I was losing my identity and but I kept fighting because I really believed in the brand of BET and I wanted to make sure that it was gonna be successful. Well, you know, life gets in the way, roadblocks, that really I realized it wasn't about me. And I was able to move on. But what I have learned through all of this, that I finally had gathered the courage through therapy and inspiration from other people to be able to move forward and to rebuild my life because I had built my life around a man. And it was just time to start building my life for me. Sorry, man. So it was a case where I was telling the story about the trials and tribulations of my third, there's three acts in my life. The third act of my life of trying to get a resort up in Middleburg, Virginia, and Rita Braver from CBS said, it's time for you to tell your story. The story has been out there for years and years in Washington, D.C. The Washington Post had a field day with me. I could never open the Washington Post without seeing my ex-husband with some woman. And it just kind of went on and on, and I just couldn't stand it anymore. And it was time to tell my story. Well, I'm glad you did. Yeah, I'm glad you did. So you just mentioned, you break your life down into three acts in right. your book, and I want to start with act one. Yes. So your father was an African-American neurosurgeon, your mother was an accountant. Can you discuss your childhood and the role that music played in your journey? Well, this is very interesting, because uh, I know we don't have a lot of time up here, but there's so many layers here. You gotta read the book. Yeah. <laughs> um, my father was one of eight African-American neurosurgeons in the country. Uh, went to Howard and Lincoln, you know, HBCUs. But he wasn't allowed to operate on black patients. He couldn't, he wasn't hired in white hospitals. So he was hired by the VA. We had to move every 10 months. So I moved 13 times in my childhood. And as we finally settled outside of Chicago in Maywood, Illinois, life was starting to be normalized. You know, that's where I picked up the violin because all the students had be able to play a musical instrument. But as my life was going on, uh, one day my father just up and left. Just left us cold. Now, as we were talking about how women are suffering um, and just trying to get an economic footing in their life, my mother went through that. With him up and leaving, she did not have a bank account, a credit card, and he wouldn't pay child support. I had to step in immediately at age 16 because I found her on the floor having a nervous breakdown. She didn't know how to take care of us. And I really want to make this because you have to read the book and this is very important and a lesson in life for so many women. Don't think or don't assume that your life is going to be cemented because there's so many things out there. Even after my divorce, I had to hire a law firm to get my utilities changed in my name. Now this is in 2000, yeah. to get my bank account severed from his, so forth and everything. Boy, did I learn a lot of lessons. I thought I had learned them from my mother, but I had to relearn it again. Life goes in a full circle. It is just unbelievable, and I swore that I would never end up being that desperate with my mother and I ended up doing the same thing. 
through it all, it seems like music grounded you and the it arts in general. Did. I know uh, both of your parents played the piano. Yes. You'll have to read the book to find out why she doesn't like to play the piano. But you chose the violin. It's yes. a funny thing. It yeah. is a funny thing. You chose a violin and that really helped you throughout your life in school and in starting right. your first business. The arts have grounded me. They have been the foundation in my life and to this day they still are. I'm involved with the Met in New York City. I sat on the board of Parsons School of Design. I had my own orchestra. I taught for many, many years. Um, performed uh, in the Middle East. Performed in the Middle East, played with Chicago Civic Symphony, one season under Jean Martinon with the Chicago Symphony. But to this day, arts are my solace. And it, I take the arts and I blend them through every single act of my life. And we can talk about that as we move along. Yes, ma'am, we will. I want to mention your parents bought you an 18th century violin worth $15,000. You heard me correct. You sold that violin to start BET. Looking back, what are your thoughts on that sacrifice? Would you do it again and did you get that violin back? Well, you know, whenever you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to start a company. Now, I have to say I was an entrepreneur before BET because I ran my own, I did music lessons and uh, you have to read the book. It's really <laughs> layered. But going into BET, I knew that everything was stacked against us being an Af African Americans. But one thing that happened, my ex was a, a, um, what are, a lobbyist for the National Cable Television Association went up on the hill to take a senior citizen up there to see if he could get funding and permission to do a senior citizen channel. Now you have to understand because media is changing by the day. That was the birth of all of cable. That was CNN, Nickelodeon, MTV, you name it. That's the birth of all of cable. But no one was paying attention to the African American voice. And when this man could not get the funding, I got hold of the proposal, was able to cross out senior citizen and wrote black in there. So he had done all the homework for me. So it was a case where I said, we've got to do this. And you've got to make sacrifices when you make that decision. So I decided, I said, where are we going to get the money from? And Bob, my ex-husband, said, well, there's John Malone who owns all the cable franchises across the state, all the states. So we flew out to Denver. John Malone said this is the best idea since sliced bread. Wrote a check for $500,000. Man, I just thought suddenly we were rich, you know, and that this was going to be, that in, in media business, it goes like that overnight. So we were able to get things, you know, licensing and all that set up, and that costs a lot of money, lawyers. But then we had to rent space to bring in employees, and we had to get cameras. At that time, the 15000 the violin was now valued at a much higher price. So one thing that I had to do, the only asset that we had at the time was my violin. I decided to make the sacrifice. I did not tell my mother because she had mortgaged the house to get this violin, um, to pay for office space and get some camera crew in there. Um, at the time, I did it. It was necessary because we had to make the sacrifice to make it work. Do I regret it? No. I don't regret it. I have bought another violin since then. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. So music never disappears from your story like we were speaking about a little bit earlier. Uh, you actually supported your family by teaching music lessons out of your house. You were flipping real estate too to keep you guys afloat as BET got started. Right, because we weren't pulling in a dime. Um, and at the time I had 110 students. I was able to, I was going from house to house, not at 110 that time, I had about 40. And I was going from house to house teaching but what had happened, I ended up buying a townhouse in southwest Washington. I only had to put $5,000 down. Took the $5,000. At that time, it was worth $30,000, the townhouse. Was in it for about a year. I continued to save every penny I could. And then I decided, because I, I was watching the values, I needed to move to northwest Washington, which was a more fluent area. And most of my students were living up there because I was teaching at Sidwell Friends. 
So I was able to flip that real estate for 68000 to buy a $115,000 house. So I, I have really learned the real estate market. But these are things that you have to do. And that was my first business that I set up because I knew and I studied the tax laws that if I taught in the basement, I could write off one third of the house, which was the best thing. I was only making $7,200 teaching at Sidwell Friends. So I went from $7,200 to making $68,000 by teaching. That orchestra became so famous that we were playing at the, uh, which is, became the Trump Hotel, the old post office pavilion. Um, the delegation from Amman Jordan was touring the city. Queen Noor was standing over there. I didn't know who she was. <laughs> and so our orchestra was performing. That orchestra was really good. And so at the end, I had the kids stand up and take a bow. And then a guy by the name of Dr. Mazin um, Armuti came up onto the stage and he says, please keep the kids here. Her Majesty wishes to meet them. And I played dumb. I said, oh, that's wonderful. I still didn't know who she was. <laughs> anyway, Queen Noor came on up and I told the kids, I said, this is, I found out by the time who she was, Queen Noor of Jordan. And she went around and shook every one of their hands. Dr. Armuti asked me to come off the stage. He says, I need you to come to the Jordanian ambassador's house tomorrow night. And I'm like, what in the world is going on here? I said, well, can you tell me what's happening? He says, Her Majesty just really loves your orchestra. To make a very long story short, we were invited to be the only children performers to come to the oldest cultural festival in the Middle East, and that's Jarash. The King Center's playing. It was unbelievable. And it was, it was really, uh, and the State Department got behind us. It was just really an amazing event. But it was also, when I think of what's going on now with Israel, Palestine, and what's going on, I ran into those same situations there where I met with the State Department to help us understand, because I didn't, I was naive. I didn't know what was happening. And to talk with the parents how we're going to use the arts to communicate peace. And it worked out beautifully. And the King sent us playing over. Um, we didn't have problems with passports or anything. It turned out to be an unbelievable experience, not only for me, but for the children, because they invited us back four times. I ended up getting the highest medal from the King, Al Nada, in education. And so. <laughs> I also built the Music Conservatory in Amman, and it's still there, and, and the kids are still performing over there. Wow. Yeah. You know, Sheila, I'm so blown away uh, because there was so much going on in yeah. your life behind the scenes during this time, but you continue to push ahead and innovate and do incredible things. At, at what point in your journey did you realize BET was a, a success? It started as two hours of programming. When did you know, hey, this is a success? I knew it was going to be a success from the very beginning. Because when you're the only game in town, it's in interesting. I was just having, I talked with Linda Johnson Rice about a month ago. And she's, we were talking about, you know, she did Ebony Magazine. And she says, at first, you know, we were just really jealous because we were the only game in town. She says, then you go on to television. I said, she says, no, this all worked out great. And I said, I wish your father was still alive. We, we could have really merged and done something very powerful together. Um, I just had that instinct that I knew it was going to be great. Mm -hmm. But we suffered in the beginning. We could not get advertisers, sponsors, anybody. Because you know, that pay, that's what pays the bills. Yeah. And so no one believed in putting money behind a black network, even though African Americans are the biggest spenders with Procter & Gamble and all of these. So McDonald's finally did step up, and that was our first advertiser. But you know what really opened the door, and this is interesting. During that time, MTV, you know, the videos were starting to come up, but MTV would not play any black artists. The doors open. So we brought on Michael Jackson. We brought in everybody. Those videos in the beginning, listen to me, in the beginning were wonderful. It was the art of storytelling right. to its highest level through music. 
I, I just said, this is just amazing. You know, it's like watching short movies, you know. Then about nine months, 10 months later, it went downhill. And what I didn't like was the way women were being portrayed in the video market. This really upset me so much that I started a show called Teen, Teen Summit. Teen Summit. Yeah. And the purpose of that show was to teach these young women about smart TV watching and to establish some values in their lives. Because what they saw on the screen, I did not want booty shaking out on the street. Okay, I just didn't want it because if you turn the volume down, it looked like pornography to me. And I just didn't like our network being the messenger of that. Now, of course, I butted heads within the company and it really butted heads. But you know what? It was such an important show because even Bill Clinton came to me. We had an off the chart pregnancy problem among teens at the time. So I partnered with Brookings Institute and the White House. And we brought that subject matter into Teen Summit to talk about safe sex, talk to your parents, why aren't they talking and communicating to you about sex so that you don't get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Education is a priority. And it made such this. a huge and impact with that it initiative. It made a huge impact. We won every award in the book. Remember there were ACE awards and we finally were nominated for Emmys and everything. But my ex-husband, because of its success, did not want to keep it on the air. So I butted heads again, and I went to the Kaiser Foundation, and they are the ones that kept that show on the air for 11 years. Incredible. We were on there. Incredible. So I want to transition into Act 3. Uh, mm -hmm. You sell BET. You get a divorce. Oh, yes. You can talk about all, you, you can read about all of that in the book. We won't discuss it all. But you sell BET. Can you describe that moment when you were in New York and you saw that the company had sold? Yeah, I was at Times Square. I had already filed for divorce because I'd found out about the husband doing the ring dang doodle with every these, all these women. <laughs> and I said, you know, enough is enough. Yeah. And I, he says, well, I'm firing you. I said, you can't fire me from my company. And he says, I want you out of here because I finally did have the courage to confront him about his behavior. And um, he got so angry, that's when he says, I'm firing you. He just wanted me out of the way so I didn't have to keep watching all this mess. So then anyway, um, I said, you really can't fire me. I said, you're gonna sell the company. That is the reason why BET was sold. It's still, we still would have owned it at this point. But I filed for divorce and I remember being at Times Square in New York City, and the ticker tape was going around the buildings, and it says, Black Entertainment to Television sold for $3 billion. I went, hallelujah. <laughs> it's finally all paying off. <laughs> so I made sure my ducks were in a row. I had kept, I'm gonna tell you something, women. When you're going through anything, you keep strict records not only of finances, but if your husband is like messing around, keep records of that, do all of that, because that's what's gonna get you through court. Yeah. And I had all the ammunition in the book. Yeah. 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 So in act three, that happens, and you could have decided to take that money and live a, live a comfortable life. But you decided to, to do something new, to try a new uh, challenge. You transitioned from entertainment mogul to hospitality right. mogul. So why did you decide to take on yet another challenge uh, that would later become the Salamander Collection? Well, first of all, um, I didn't know anything about the hospitality yeah. business. It took me two years, really, to regroup. Now, I want to tell you, I was going through immense therapy at the time. I was abused so badly in my marriage, emotional abuse, that I had to get really serious therapy. My kids and I also went through therapy together. Um, and this is very important, I'm not ashamed of it, but it's the reason why I'm up on this stage right now. Yeah, and your now husband helped you through that process. Yeah, right? now let's not spoil this, okay? okay, okay? Yeah. Um, Forget you heard that. So anyway, um, I went through therapy, and it took me about two years, about, well, no, about a year, 
Once I moved, I had to get out of Washington, D.C. It could be a tough city to live in. I had to get out of there and rebuild my life, and I bought a farm. Um, it was first called Cotswold, and then I didn't like that name, and I decided who was the owner before that, and it was a man by the name of Bruce Sunland. He was a, a World War II fighter pilot that was shot down over Nazi-occupied Belgium. He was able to escape. His entire unit was put into a POW camp. He went across Europe. I hope I'm talking fast enough so we can get all this You're doing good. You're doing good? Okay. <laughs> and he ended up in the Allied territory of France and uh, fought briefly for the French resistance. The U.S. came to him and he says, we've got to go and rescue your unit out of the POW camp. And they, they said, he said, well, great. Now, this is a true story because Hogan's Heroes is Bruce Sunland. So then anyway, uh, we're going to give you the code name Salamander. So I, when I met him, he told me this story. And I said, well, what does it mean? He says, they told me it was the only animal that could walk through fire and still come out alive. And I said, man, I was going through fire. And I said, I need that. I said, can I have it? He says, you can have it. But you know, your little salamanders out there, if you cut off their limbs, they regenerate. I needed to regenerate. Yeah. And as my mother kept saying, you got to get your power back. Yeah. 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 So anyway, I'm out in Virginia. And the first thing I realized, every time I drove into that little quaint town, there was a gun shop on the right-hand side called the Powder Horn that had a Confederate flag in the window. And I got angrier and angrier, and I called my attorney, and I said, look, I need you to find out who owns that building. I gave him the address and everything. He goes, why do you want to buy that building? I said, because I can. <laughs> I said, we're going to change a little bit of history here. Yeah. <laughs> so I bought the building, gutted it, took the flag out of there, and it's now a wonderful little market where you can get breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and have meetings, do whatever you want. But it's, it's wonderful. The other thing that I did was I built a performing arts center because my kids were going to the local school and there was no, it was a wonderful arts program, but they had nowhere to perform. So I took care of that too. So we got an incredible performing arts center, which has worked out great. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. So <laughs> you moved to Middleburg. Yeah. You decide to open up a resort. It looks like everything's going great. The town seems excited about it. And Oof. then you start a decade-long battle to get it done. Yes. So this was really hard. Um, Pamela Harriman had passed away. You know, she was our U.S. ambassador to France in a swimming pool at the Ritz in Paris. So um, this was right after Ron Brown was, I remember that, because I was at his funeral, and she was in the same pew at the National Cathedral with me. This is really weird. This is a God wink. And she, I, I don't know whether she had had her face lifted or something, but she looked good. And she was in a beautiful emerald suit. And she leaned over and looked at me and blew me a kiss. Wow. I said, I don't really know her. Right. So I didn't know what was happening then. But shortly after that, she did pass away. And sure enough, I ended up buying all of her property, which is where the resort is located. It was brought to me by the broker of the estate. And um, naive again. I said, I have the greatest idea. The town of Middleburg was bankrupt. They needed a new water sewage treatment plant. They were sanctioned by the state, by the quality, lack of quality of the water. This went on and on. And I said, I know exactly what I needed to do. I stood up there and I said, if I build this resort there, it would become the economic anchor of the town. So I had a nice little groundbreaking up there, and I had food. People grazed through the food. They're smiling at me. I said, this is just a great idea, Sheila. Boy, the next day I woke up, and on both sides of the road had signs of don't be E.T. Middleburg. I said, boy, was I fooled. This went on for 10 years. I had to go through hearings after hearings after hearings, hear my name being dragged through the mud. My life was being threatened. My kids' lives were threatened. I bought a Doberman. I had security. Yeah. Um, Navy SEALs, right? Yeah, Navy SEALs. Navy SEALs uh, 
watching the property because people were hopping the fence. I mean, and the FBI finally had to come in. I mean, enough was enough. Yeah. But this was the nastiest fight. It was all in the newspapers. It's all in the book. So you can read about that. But in the end, I won by one vote. One vote. <laughs> one vote. Okay, I want to get to your beautiful property and properties. Uh, you host several uh, things on, on your land, including a film festival. Uh, we're going to run a short clip of that film festival, so cue the video. Brendan Fraser. Have courage. You're gonna need it. Please welcome Ken Brennan. Sterling K. Brown. This festival it has the greatest taste, and I feel really honored. joking on the phone that's gonna be a fireside chat and not knowing it's literally a fireside <laughs> chat. <laughs> There's a real thrill for filmmaking, and that's really important right now. Laughing and crying with strangers and creating this kind of connection. Best film festival in the world. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's talk about that, bringing Hollywood to Virginia. Now that happens in October, and it's become wildly successful. You've had so many incredible film, films that have gone There's on to win awards. What has it been like to have all of those actors, directors, writers, creatives come through? It's been terrific, and one of the reasons why I wanted to do, bring a film festival there, again, is the art of storytelling. It was my way of communicating to the community how we can band together. It's like sports. You know, it's that universal, people love movies. The movies also are, they teach lessons to people. And I did the movie The Butler with Lee Daniels. And we had done, I showed The Butler at the very first film festival. And the thing that was really interesting, Lee and I were up on the stage and there was a man, it was a white man in the front and he was crying his eyes out. And I said, what's wrong? He says, I want you to forgive me. He had put me through the hell wow. of getting the resort up, wow. see? So what had happened, I was able to start bridging yeah. that link there. And we bring films that are done by female directors and we do you know, directors of color. And it's just been amazing. I mean, we did the film Loving where I was able to bring Eric Holder to talk about the Supreme Court decision. David Gergen had been there, you know, talking about politics and films. Yeah. These are conversations that we need to start having. And the film industry and through the arts, we can do that. 
so. Beautiful. Something else that uh, you host, the family yes. reunion. Uh, now, can we talk about that, celebrating food and diversity? Yes. Now, I think that the restaurant industry would really be interested in this. What happened in, during COVID, there were so many black-owned restaurants that shut down, both male and female, across the country. There was one restaurant in particular that was on the wharf in Washington, D.C. by Kwame Amawachi. I had gone to his restaurant twice. My staff had brought me there for my birthday. I have never tasted food like this in my life. This was food that was really celebrate the African diaspora in an incredible way. If you saw the Netflix film High on the Hog, um, with Dr. Harris and everything, this is what we're talking about. And um, they threw him out of the Intercontinental. I was so angry. It was in the Washington Post. I called him. I said, Kwame, you're coming with me. Now, this is, you know, at the time, he was in his late 20s. Um, but he's so talented. And so we got together, and we decided that we were going to really address the issues of the lack of diversity in the culinary industry and how we could start bringing more and more people of color, both men and women, through this restaurant industry and really elevate them. Now the thing that's happened with this, and you're gonna see this clip in a minute, um, Food and Wine has gotten behind us. Yeah. So when I talked to the CEO of Food and Wine, Connor, I had been beaten on him because we, you know, you saw that we're in Aspen now, and Aspen Food and Wine, I remember Carla Hall saying to me, I'm not coming back here anymore. I'm, me and Kwame are the only black chefs there. And so I talked to Hunter and talked to Hunter and I started inviting him to this. And we do something in Aspen at the end of Food and Wine. It's called the Juneteenth event. It, it, we're blowing it out of the water. Food and Wine magazine now wants us to, they want to now put an umbrella over this. They are so proud of this. I got to get some money out of them, though, first. Yes, you do. You know. Well, let's cue up that video. When you walk in, there's a different energy. There's a different spirit that comes alive once the family reunion starts. 2023, we're bigger, we're better, we're bolder. We have so much more programming this year. And now it's a true reunion. People are, are coming back year after year. There's a magic you feel when you come in the door and you carry that out into the world. We have been able to expand and really share the love and the adventures that we have here for the family. Well, doesn't that look like a great time? All right, so Ms. Sheila, I have to ask you, we've watched the video, are you going to bring the family reunion to Tampa Bay, to Innisbrook? We want it, right? Uh, we're working on it, we're working okay. on it. <laughs> we'll take it, we'll take it. Yeah. It looks so beautiful, when does that happen? That is in August. In August. And the tickets will go on sale in February, so you need to get on our website because they sell out within 24 to 48 hours. I know they do. I have so many friends who come to that every year and love it. Yes. Okay. So I want to quickly, before we wrap up, I want to leave some time for audience questions. So if you have questions, be thinking of them. We'll have uh, mics out in the audience for you to ask Ms. Sheila. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about the love of your life. Yes. Yes. And how There you is met. a happy ending There here. is. There's redemption here. So um, one part that I left out when I was teaching at Sidwell Friends, I wasn't making enough money to make ends meet. So I was there, there was a play called the West End um, Theater. The Negro Ensemble Company had come down from New York and they were doing ceremonies in Dark Old Men. And one of the uh, actresses had to leave, there were only two female parts in there. She had to leave to go back to, I think it was Denise Nichols, she was doing Room 222, she had to go back to Hollywood. And, so I went down and auditioned. There was a line. I couldn't believe it. The week later, I got a call that I was selected okay. to do this. I played the part of a prostitute. <laughs> but it was a fun, uh, it, I didn't do anything dirty or anything. <laughs> but my job was to get some information, a recipe out to how to make bootleg whiskey. And it was a case where I had to dance with this man, Russell, across the stage and get him into bed. It was all timing situation. And I kind of, okay, come on, Russell, just give me a little bit. Just, you know, trying to get this. And so anyway, he, um, all of a sudden he starts snoring and the audience just falls out. So I didn't do what I was supposed to do, right? 
So then anyway, the play went for 98 performances, sold out every night. It just went on and on. And finally we closed down. And uh, there were other people in the play. And uh, I went to get my divorce. And I walked into the courthouse, into the chambers where, and I looked at the judge and I said, I think I know you. <laughs> and so I <laughs> turned to my lawyer, he says, don't you say a word, we're getting through this. <laughs> I said, okay. And so at the end, it lasted 20 minutes because the ex didn't even show up, neither did his lawyer. See, I had it done, I did it right. So then anyway, I, he says, now you can, go talk to him. I said, Your Honor, may I approach the bench? And he says, yes, you may. And he kept looking down at the papers. I said, by any chance, do you remember me? He goes, oh, yes, I, I do. <laughs> so anyway, I'm looking, there's no wedding ring, nothing on, you know. <laughs> so at the time, I was president of the Washington International Horse Show, and we were having a gala in the arena and I invited him, I, you know how when we're gonna take the bull by the horns. Yeah. And I sent him an invitation, I said to the Honorable William T. Newman and guest. His mother said, you not taking anybody with you. He says, I remember how you felt about that woman years ago. He says, but mom, she just went through a divorce. He goes, you're not taking anyone. Right. So three weeks later we started dating and then we got married three years after that. But the best thing about this man is he went through the therapy with me right. and the children. Yeah. He knew everything that I've been going through. He said, I'm not a judge for nothing. He says, I hear this stuff. Yeah. I know the police officers, the sheriffs. He goes, I know exactly what you've been through. And he went through the therapy with me. Wow. And I will tell you, for the first time in my life, I feel safe. It's beautiful. Well, I'd like to end, Miss Sheila. So I, I want to end with something. You go ahead. Do yes, what you're because her to book do. ends on such a beautiful note. You offer some advice yes. to your younger self. Uh, yes. So I'd love for you to read that to the audience because I think it will be impactful for everyone in this room. Yes. Sixteen and a half years had passed since my divorce from Bob. It's been a little longer than that when I wrote this. Exactly half the time we had been together, I was finally free. If I could go back in time and talk to my younger self, I would tell her this. Trust your instincts. Get to know who you are before you give yourself to someone else. Believe that you can find happiness and that you deserve it. You are going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Ms. Sheila Johnson, everyone. Okay, I want to open up for audience questions. Does anyone have a question? Raise your hand. Okay, we have some questions back there. Please stand up, say your name, what you do, and ask your question. Hi, Sheila. My name is Tammy Davis. Commitments and responsibilities because it seems like you really do have it all. Be very, very careful who you bring into your orbit. There are a lot of people who just want to jump on your coattails and ride with you, and I call them energetic vampires. <laughs> and you also have to set boundaries. Um, make sure that whoever you bring in to help you set up your company, to make your life work, that they're trustworthy. I've learned to do a lot of background checks, investigations. I put them on 90-day trial periods, and if I can then start watching carefully if this person's going to work or not. My chief of staff has been with me for 20 years. She's my other husband. <laughs> <laughs> my average, all of the, the executives that I brought in from starting Salamander are still with me. Wow. Yes, the newest ones, I mean, you know, now three years. But because we do respect one another and trust one another, um, they're with me. And that makes my life a lot easier. That's why I can go out on a book tour, I can go to my games, I can run my mystics, I can talk with my Caps players. I wish my NBA team would do something. Because <laughs> um, we did win a national championship with the mystics and the Stanley Cup, and I know you all have won many of them. 
So, but um, it's just important that you have a good workforce and support because it gives you the freedom to be able to then diversify your ideas and your passion. If you don't have people that you can trust and can be there, there is no way I could have done anything that I'm doing. So that's my answer. Great question. All right, do we have another audience question? Yes. Oh. Stand up, say your name, oh. what you do, and ask your question, oh. please. Sure. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you, Sheila. <coughs> Hi, Sheila. Penny Parks. I'm on the Copperhead Charities Board. Oh, good. And, yes. And so you, I have to ask you, you mentioned earlier, and you and I have talked about this in the past, how is the, the capital funding that you have done for, for women-owned businesses and businesses of color, can you just give us a brief update? How's that, how's that going? Uh, we're close to $30 million now. We've raised $30 million. <laughs> and the companies that we're helping, they are really making a social impact on the communities. And we just don't throw money out. And this is not a charity. We make money off of this, okay? We want to play like the men do. We want to be in the same sandbox. So my investors that I bring in, I got to guarantee their returns. Now, it's going to be a five to eight year window if they're willing to hang in there and the patients, but help these women grow some of the most powerful companies through tech, through um, uh, maternal uh, help, mm -hmm. whatever do, they have to make an impact on the community. We monitor this. We monitor the stock, we monitor everything. We help and bring other investors into their company too. But that's how it is. I know that was something that was important for you because you couldn't even get a loan when starting uh, the resort there in Virginia and Middleburg. All. With all the money I had in the bank, and I will tell you a really quick story. I remember going to a big bank in New York who was handling my money, and I made an appointment to go in there, and I said, I really need help. Teach, help me grow my money. Mm -hmm. All right, I got this much. Help me grow. They didn't take me seriously. They sent some, I don't know where this woman came from. She came spinning around. I also can remember her petticoats. <laughs> spinning around, and the men that were supposed to be in there handling never showed up. I got in the car. The next day, I pulled every penny out of that bank. They kept calling. <laughs> One thing you learn, you all have got to be champions of yourselves. Don't put up with this crap. And I think the more you stand for yourself, believe me, they're not going to mess with you anymore. And it's not a case that I'm being the B word or I'm being ugly or anything. Like that I got to protect my, my assets. And that's what it came down to. They just didn't take me seriously. One more question in the audience. One more question. Stand up, say your name, and ask your question, please. Hi, thank you for sharing your vulnerabilities and your story. It's very inspiring. My question was about your children. I have two children, and I'm curious, how do you share your success and your story with them? I have always involved my kids in every step of everything that I've done. The one thing that was shocking to me is my daughter came to me, maybe it was three months ago, after she saw the book out and everything. She says, Mom, I'm glad you read it, uh, wrote it, you're a badass. But I want to tell you something, you were depressed my whole life growing up. And that really, it was like a knife going through my heart. Because one thing I've learned, don't think you are protecting your kids from whatever's happening in your marriage. They are watching everything. But luckily they went through the therapy with me. Um, but not only them, they have always been involved and watching me as I've grown my businesses. Uh, I remember taking my daughter all the way to Jordan and she's in a bassinet and I have her right up under the, um, you know, where I'm, uh, under the uh, podium where I'm conducting. And then she, had, as she got bigger, she went to the drum section. I mean, so <laughs> there were things like that. She was all, you know, she learned to walk in the palace in Jordan. Wow. There were things like that. My son, then she got into horses. And she has been, she's a stellar athlete. She was on the Nations Cup team. She was third in the world, everything. So we, we work together and my son is a great athlete and uh, actually played against Russell Wilson in high school. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, beat him too. <laughs> uh, 
but they are so involved in my life and they always have been I've always been there for them um, I just remember waking up at four in the morning and making sure there was dinner already done because I had to take my daughter to riding lessons all the way into Virginia but you know I made sure I built those sef safety nets in there so that they never felt neglected and of course they don't remember all that but I do <laughs> but you do the best you can and they know everything that is going on in my life my son's a menswear designer and he commutes to Milan I go to Milan with him I help him pick out fabrics it's a lot of fun I've watched his shows at PT in Florence and, uh, and in Milan he's now in Saks in in Chicago and in Chevy Chase at the Saks store there. He's in a lot of stores in Europe. So I'm very proud of both of them. I'm a grandma now, and my little five-year-old granddaughter, she walks around with my book, this is grandma. This is grandma. <laughs> Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. We could talk to you all day, but thank you so much for so giving welcome. us some of your time and sharing your story. So with welcome. Sheila Johnson, thank everyone. you.